2 Corinthians 13. Our study tonight, the second to last study in the book is a tough one. But an important one. The first five verses. Would you read along with me please? Paul says, this will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others. Since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He's not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, we will live with him to serve you. And while that's true about the Apostle Paul, that verse is true about every single one of us in everything that we do. So he says, examine yourselves, take a test. To see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Father, we want no one to fail. That's why we're so grateful when we read that even when we're faithless, you're faithful. When I pray continually, Lord, that... that My confidence is that you who began this good work in me and each and every one of us, even in our church body, you began it in you, not us. You will be faithful to complete it. And for that, we thank you because we can rest from our own work. Tonight, I pray that we will open our hearts to be examined. Lord, don't take no for an answer. We offer our hearts open wide. By your spirit, dig deep. I pray by the time we leave here tonight, we've dealt with whatever issues need to be dealt with, that we can leave here tonight and stand before you and say, I am yours, Lord. Not only am I yours, but I'm yours to be used for your glory. Repentance is easier than consequence. So tonight, bring us to that place where we simply acknowledge our sin, anything that we're holding back from you. Ask for forgiveness and receive the fullness of your mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead that also lives in us. It just never makes sense to me, Lord, to have all that power available and to remain disconnected. Help us to love you more than ever before. I do pray, Father, that if there's even one here tonight who isn't born again, that he or she would say yes tonight to the pleading of the Holy Spirit. We love you, Jesus. Have your way in our hearts in this next to last study, the penultimate of this glorious book. Please, Lord, have your way. In your name we pray, amen. If you've ever been examined by Bruce Civil, then you almost surely have come to the conclusion that he's got to be the best nurse in the whole world. Now, one of the reasons he's the best nurse in the whole world is because he doesn't listen to a thing that you say. <laughs> he doesn't, you know, when I go to the doctor, I like to presume that I'm in control. You know, well, I don't need this or I need this, I need this. And whenever it's Bruce that's doing the examining of me, he just sort of like nods his head and tells funny stories and every once in a while says something biblical, you know, and then just keeps doing whatever it was he was going to do when I got there. He completely ignores any of my requests. And the truth is he does it and you know he does it in such love that you can't say no to him. And the reason we can't say no to him is because we understand, don't we, that he really only wants what's best for us. I actually tried telling him no once. It took me two weeks to recover. <laughs> but my point is this. If we can't say no to Bruce, 
Why is it that we say no to the Spirit of God? Who also only wants the best for us, who only wants the most for us, who wants to dig deep, who wants to do what's best for us, and yet we have a tendency to close our heart to him when he starts digging a little deep. The church at Corinth has been a carnal church. I've told you this many times throughout our study together. The first letter to the Corinthians is a scolding rebuke. A carnal church doing almost everything wrong. Paul has nothing good to say to them, only to correct them so that he can get to this point where though he's still defending his own ministry, he's still under attack from a certain segment, a certain element in the church at Corinth. He really only does want, want what's best for them. Problem is, they learn to say no to the Apostle Paul. I'm praying that tonight we won't because we know it's really the Holy Spirit pushing his pen. He says, this will be my third visit to you. You know, there have been times in my walk with Jesus when I was sure that I was doing everything God wanted me to do. A time when I thought my heart was right. But a time would come soon, usually in prayer, in these examine your heart wrestling matches, when I discovered that even though I was doing the right things, I was often doing them with the wrong heart. There have been times when I've been asked for advice and gave what I thought was godly counsel. But then later in a time of prayer, okay, Lord, you know my heart. You know everything about my heart. The Lord would let me know that the counsel that I gave may have sounded godly, but it didn't come from him. It was more from me. Well, that sets up this next to last study in 2 Corinthians because tonight we need to dig really deep. That is, we're going to look in the one place, the only place the Holy Spirit will take us, and that place is your own heart. Not the heart of your spouse, not the heart of the people you work with, not the heart of the people you're sitting next to, but tonight requires each and every one of us to dig deep into our own hearts. I think in a loving way, at least I'm confident it's a loving way, get ready to be offended. I've looked deep within my own heart and many times been offended by what I found there. But the great thing about the blood of Jesus, it cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to purify us from all unrighteousness. We need only to be honest enough to give him the opportunity. The book of Acts doesn't provide a record of Paul's visiting Corinth between the writings of the first and second letters. So we don't know when this visit occurred, but this verse makes it clear that he had been to Corinth twice before now and was preparing to visit yet again. This, I'm sure, the apostle thought would not be a pleasant trip, although most of the church in Corinth had responded positively to his first letter. There were still a handful of troublemakers led by the false teachers that we've been talking about throughout this book about who for the sake of the church had to be dealt with. Now, one of the ways that we can follow Paul's example in ministry is his willingness to be patient with difficult people. One of the fruits of the Spirit, if you have a King James Bible, is long-suffering, and unfortunately means to suffer for a long time. Paul was willing to suffer with people just for chance to win their hearts. He was willing to be patient with difficult people. Who could have blamed Paul had he gotten angry at the church in Corinth after all of the things that we've been reading and studying? He was being unfairly accused. People who even agreed with him, who knew him better, were listening to and some of them even believing the lies that were spread about him. And all the while, like our nurse Bruce, he had only their best interests at heart. We might wonder how could he be so patient Well, the answer is in Acts chapter 18, in verses 9 and 10. It was in one of the low parts of Paul's life. It says there, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Paul was ready to give up in ministry. It looked like there was no effective ministry to be had. He was being stalled at every turn. 
Nobody was responding to the message. The persecution was increasing minute by minute. And one night, Jesus appeared to Paul in a vision and said this, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. It's in the continuous present tense in Greek. Do not be silent. Always be talking. And here's why. For I'm with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you. Here's the key. Because I have many people in this city. You see, the reason Paul could be patient, the reason we need to be patient with difficult people is because they belong to Jesus. They're not ours to judge. They're not ours to discard. They're not ours to be frustrated with or to get angry with. When we lose patience with people that he loves, people for whom he died, we forget whose they are. Paul didn't dare lose patience or become frustrated with the people of God. One of the major problems today that the church has is its witness in its witness rather for Jesus is that we too often misrepresent him with our own frustration and our own impatience. And Paul is an example throughout this letter of reminding us of the need to love through all circumstances. When we get angry with Jesus or when we get angry while serving Jesus, we're forgetting two critical things. The first is that Jesus never was angry or impatient with you. And maybe if you're here tonight and you're under some delusion that Jesus is angry with you, that he's frustrated with you, that he's done with you, you're wrong. He's never been angry. He's never been impatient with you, not for one moment. The second thing we forget is that we forget who we're serving. If we find ourselves in this world, we really have to look deep into our own hearts because if we find ourselves getting frustrated with people, then the truth is that we're really revealing who it is we're serving. We're serving for us. We're not serving to serve others. We're not serving even to serve Jesus. We're serving to get a response, a response that we want. Jesus would say to each and every one of us tonight as he asks us to dig deep into our own hearts, he would say to us, for I have many people in this city and I want to use you He might even say to you tonight, I have many people on your prayer list and I want to use you to reach them. All we have to do is remember constantly to whom they belong. You know, the best example in all of scripture of just how seriously God takes how he's represented by his people is in the life of Moses. Moses speak to the rock. Moses was angry and frustrated. He struck the rock twice and we know the story. It cost him his entrance into the promised land. Until and unless we can learn to exercise patience willingly and joyfully with God's people, no one in this room will ever realize the full scope of ministry that God has for you. As we begin examining our hearts, it always begins with remembering who it is that we're serving. Paul says, every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And then he says, I already gave you a warning. My first witness, I come, I've come another time. If I have to come another time, I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others. You know, this verse always reminds me of those times when I would mess up as a little kid. And my mother would look at me and she would say, you wait till your father gets home. My mom was a real tiny lady, 98 pounds most of her life. And the best she could do was with a wooden spoon. And she would grab me and she would wail, but it didn't hurt. We acted like it did because we didn't want her to think it didn't. But that's the best she could do. And she'd wail and she'd get angry and angry, but it just didn't hurt. But when my dad came home, it was a completely different thing. Roger, she would say, and he knew the tone of voice, and his belt came off in his hand, Ronnie, into the bedroom, and I knew what was coming. Well, that's sort of what Paul is doing here. Don't make me come out there is what Paul is saying. Now, this sounds ominous to those among us who are delaying dealing with sin in our lives. It's just the way it is. We always think God's mad. We always think something bad is coming. We always think we're being punished. Why? Because we're unwilling to take the test. We're unwilling to examine our hearts. And because we are, we're guilty. We feel guilty. We act guilty. 
And Paul is trying to set up the Corinthians so that they're free rather than guilty of anything. Paul could not be more clear for God's people, for you and I, if we're going to pass any tests tonight, we must deal with the sin in our own hearts. Sooner or later and sooner is always better. Paul, you see, is letting them know that the day is coming when all of their foolishness is going to have to end and people will be exposed for what they really are instead of what they claim to be. An opportunity is presented here to talk a little bit about church discipline because Jesus dealt with this issue. Paul is talking about discipline in the church of Jesus Christ at Corinth. But what he's saying is, look, you can take care of this yourselves. But it's also, we're told by Jesus, necessary to discipline inside the church as Paul has done repeatedly in his two letters to the Corinthians. You know, as Jesus' personal representative in Corinth, Paul was making sure that the Corinthians knew what he would deal with and he would deal with them the way Jesus commanded in Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. In Matthew 18, in verses 15 through 17, Jesus gives us a three-step process for dealing with sin inside the church, but it's also a great process for you as you examine your own hearts. He says, first, if your brother sins against you, if somebody's hurt your feelings, if somebody's done something wrong, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. Never forget that's the goal of discipline. It's the goal of examining your heart. When, when the Holy Spirit's knocking on the door of your heart, he's doing so because he wants fellowship with you to be restored again. He's not doing it to put you in the doghouse. He's not doing it to make you feel like you've done something horrible. He's doing it to wipe your slate clean. The same is true of church discipline. Every Christian owes Jesus this response when someone sins against them. And I'm not talking about becoming the Holy Spirit police. What I am talking about is loving someone enough to go to him or to go to her privately when what they are doing is causing you pain. It's really a cruel thing. If somebody has offended you, not to say something, you, you need to check your heart and you need to say it in love. But a lot of us, I want to say this nicely and I'm speaking very personally now, a lot of us are dense. Unless you tell us we've done something that hurts your feelings, we don't know it. I just assume everybody means what they say and say what they mean. And so if somebody's done something to offend you, you need to tell them. Pull them aside and say, you know what? I really didn't want to have to say anything, but I really feel like it's a loving thing to do. When you said this, you hurt my feelings. Or when you did this, it hurt my feelings. And I just needed you to know that that's what happened. And in so doing, you give them a chance to say, wow, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. I didn't think of that. Please forgive me. And if that happens, then you've won your brother over. Sometimes, especially with new believers, they don't even know what sin is. They don't know how to deal with stuff. So if they've said something offensive, just pull them aside and tell them nicely and quietly. Now, in doing this, we need to be careful of two things. The first is that we need to be careful we go to somebody that what they've done is really a sin. If somebody hurts your feelings by telling you the truth in love, they haven't sinned against you. They've just loved you. Make sure that what they've done to you really is a sin and then go to them with meekness, a spirit of kindness. I've had a lot of young Christians' hearts broken because they've been approached by an older, seemingly more mature Christian and taken to task for something they're doing that's called sinning that the Bible doesn't define as sin at all. None of us have the right to impose our standard of behavior on another brother or sister unless their conduct is specifically prohibited by scripture. So go to somebody in love and tell them what they've done. Now, if there's a general sin, and this is where this one is most often misunderstood and misused, even abused. You know, I don't like what somebody did, so I'm going to Matthew 18 them. You don't do that. That's not love. <laughs> and that's not looking in your own heart. If someone sins against you, if someone offends you, then you go to them. The second thing we have to be careful about is to make sure that we do not gossip about what we're doing to anyone else. If you tell someone else something that you think another Christian did to you, something that's wrong, then you're the one guilty of sin and you need to stop it. Go to them in love. Go after 
doing some log removal surgery in your own eye. And then let the Lord work on their hearts. That's the first thing Jesus said to do. The second thing is this in the next verse. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. This is where Paul is drawing this entire section from. From the words of Jesus himself. Now, here's what this means when somebody hasn't responded. You've told somebody what you, they did to you. They hurt your feelings or maybe it was something worse. You know, that was wrong. You sinned against me. And they say, so? Well, ask them to prayerfully consider it. If they don't do it, then after a time, take another brother or another sister or even two with you and go to them again in loving correction. Now, please notice what this does not say. It does not say you're to tell the pastor or the church leader and wait for him to contact the offending person. It's something that you are to do yourself in love. If anyone in this church comes to me or any of our elders or any of our pastors with a problem with another Christian, our first response is going to be say, well, have you gone to them privately first? And if the answer is yes, well, have you gone to them with one or two others in love? Well, no, not yet. Well, then we're going to tell you to do that. If it's something that's important to you, it's got to be important enough to you to do it the right way. So if you've done that privately, if you've now gone and taken two with you, give them some time to let the Holy Spirit convict their heart. And then the leaders in this church will step in with you. The third way that we're to exercise discipline, the third way that we're to check our own hearts as well. In the last verse there, Jesus says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen, even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I'm going to go a little off context in this for just a moment, but, but remember this is about our own test when we get back to the next verse in 2 Corinthians 13. When somebody that you know loves you comes to you and says, man, I'm worried about you. Don't put up the, oh, I'm okay. I'm fine with Jesus. Don't, don't do that. Listen to what people have to say. Somebody that before whatever you're going through happened, you would have listened to. Somebody that you respected and cared for. When they come to you, listen to them. And then go and examine your own heart. With church discipline, it's the same way. This is what Paul has in mind for his next visit in Corinth. It's similar to what we studied in chapter 2 and of this epistle and chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians dealing with putting someone out of the church. He put somebody out of the church because they wouldn't repent and everybody knew about it and he insisted that discipline be exercised. We need to be willing to go to this length to correct people who are in sin, open and rebellious sin. And we need to do it for their own good. Paul said, I'm putting such a man out of the church, handing him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. That sounds horrible. But then he says, but so that his soul might be saved on that day. We have to care enough about people to want their souls saved and nobody's soul is going to get saved if they continue to willfully rebel against what they know God wants them to do. The same thing is true as we now go into the rest of this examining our own hearts. The same thing is true for you. When people come to you, you've got to be willing to say, do they have a point? If somebody comes and just rebukes you, and just you can dismiss it. But if somebody that you know cares for you comes and says, you know what? I'm worried about you. There's just something not right. I'm watching the way you're acting. I'm listening to the tone of voice. I'm even listening to the words you say. C can I help you in any way? Then you need to go to the Lord and examine your heart. Here's why. He says in the third verse, remember he says in verse two, on my return I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others. Here's why. Since you are demanding proof, that Christ is speaking through me. He's not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. Now, any one of us who has tried to hide our sin from the Lord, and haven't we all done that at one time or another? Nothing is happening. The world isn't caving in on us. What well, must be okay? And then we continue pretending that it's okay. I often call that playing patty cake with your sins. 
Every one of us knows that it's true that he's not weak in dealing with us when the time comes. He wants to be gentle. He wants to nudge us into correction. But haven't we all learned at some point in our walk with the Lord that when God has to be direct, when he has to hit hard, he will do that very thing. Every one of us who's really born again knows that when we're guilty of sin, all the rationalizing in the world doesn't help. Sometimes even other Christians will try to give us sort of an assist. Oh, it's okay. That's not that bad. And the Holy Spirit is shouting at you, yes, it is, it is. By the way, don't help anybody that way. I've had people who said they went to somebody and said, you know, I really sinned. And no, it's not a big deal. Don't even worry about it. It is a big deal if the Holy Spirit is convicting you about it. The Holy Spirit is in us. He's the one calling shots. He's the one who's tweaking our consciences. You all know David's story. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. A little time goes by. Nobody found out. He thought he was home free. But one day she comes to him with terrible news. David, I'm going to have a baby. It's your baby. It could only be your baby. David responded sort of cool. I'll deal with this. He thought of a way out. At least he thought he thought of a way out. He brought her husband home, Uriah the Hittite, a valiant soldier fighting for David. Brought him home from the front line to the war. Gave him the opportunity to eat and drink and go lay with your wife and you go back out tomorrow. But he didn't count on Uriah's character. Being so stellar that Uriah said, no, when my comrades are out on the front lines, how can I go in and enjoy the pleasures of my wife? He slept on the doorstep not even going in. So it comes back to David. So did you go into your wife? No, how could I do such a thing? So the next night, they said, I'll stay again. We'll go one more night. And then he got him drunk. You don't say no to the king. Even then, he had too much character to go in and lay with his wife. David thought, well, he'll lay with his wife. She'll be pregnant. They'll just have an early baby and everything will be fine. Now, we know David was red-headed. We know that he was handsome, very distinguished-looking. Here's what David forgot. If that baby was born right out of the womb, that little boy would have been redheaded and just a spitting image of David. Uh, what would you do then? God's going to make sure you're going to get busted. Why? Because he loves you like Bruce. He knows what's best for you. And he's not going to take no for an answer. He refused. Some time goes by and David seems to have gotten over it after an even worse sin. He sent Uriah back to the front lines and told his armies to pull back. And Uriah, of course, was killed. Nearly a year goes by. David hoping against all hope that nobody knew, nobody suspected. But listen to this. This is how he felt during that silent year when he was hoping everything would go away. Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. I don't know if you've had that kind of an experience with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I hope you have. I have, certainly. Times when you thought you skated by and you thought nobody knows, nobody's the wiser, there's no reason to reveal it to anybody, certainly no reason to tell God about it. But you just can't rest. By the way, that's the heart of a true man or woman of God. The one who can just skate by and, 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 and just pretend as though nothing ever happened. I had a man once who really the worst attack we've ever had here at Calvary Chapel. And it failed miserably from their perspective and the ringleader, after a few years went by, tried to contact me via email first. Hey, maybe we can get together for lunch. And, and I just said, well, I, I'm not interested in getting together with you for, for, for lunch. And so he emailed me again. And he said, I know we've had our differences, 
And I thought, difference is you tried to ruin the ministry that God's given me. You tried to ruin my reputation. And I said, all you have to say is the two magic words. I'm sorry. And he never has. Oh, I know we had some differences. No, we didn't. You tried to destroy everything God is trying to do. I promise you the hand of God, if this man really belongs to him, is heavy upon him and always has been. But it just gets easy to get busy with other stuff and pretend it really wasn't that big a deal. If you're here tonight and God's trying to deal with you on something, please don't leave without dealing with it. There's a whole bunch of people going to be standing up here at the end of this service and you can come to them and you can ask for forgiveness, not of them, but you, and you don't have to be all that specific even. But tonight is a night you can deal with God. Tonight is a night you can go and that heavy hand of God be completely removed. Here's the problem, especially after a Bible study like this one. If you leave without clearing your conscience, without getting right with God, his hand gets even heavier and heavier. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Examine your heart tonight. Make sure that you don't have your own David experience. Paul continues in the fourth verse, For to be sure he was crucified in weakness, Jesus, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him to serve you. Now the value in this verse is the example that it sets for us. The value is the example it sets for us. The Lord's weakness was voluntarily. He, he, he didn't, wasn't forced. He voluntarily became weak. Isaiah 50 verse 6 says, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled up my beard. I did not hide my face from spitting and mocking. We know Jesus had 12 legions of angels at his disposal. The perfect description of meekness, which is power under control, by the way. It's not weakness. Jesus simply was willing to be a victim for you and for me. And that's what we've got to do. Okay, so I'm, I'm weak. Lord, I'll be weak for you. So that your strength can work in me and through me. There was a time when Jesus told Pilate, You have no authority over me except that it be given you by my Father in heaven. That's not weakness, that's strength, the strength of heaven. Jesus chose to be weak, and you and I were the beneficiaries. Likewise, when we choose to be weak, instead of standing up for ourselves to give in, even if somebody thinks you're being sort of taken advantage of in the process, you can look at Jesus and wink at him and say, just trying to be like you, Lord. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. We don't like that, but that's true. The picture Paul's trying to paint for the Corinthians is simple. When I come back, I would like to be like the crucified Christ in weakness, in meekness. But if I have to come back and deal with sin, believe me, I'll be like the risen Christ in all of his power. This is the way the Holy Spirit always is when dealing with your sin. When dealing with my sin... At first, he gives you that gentle nudge to let you know that something you've done is wrong. Get back in place. Just say you're sorry. Let him wipe the slate clean. But the longer you resist the nudging, the more forceful those reminders become. Finally, the conviction gets so strong that heavy hand of God upon you, conviction, the circumstances become so difficult that you'll be forced to make some choices. And that's why Paul pleads with us in our last verse tonight. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith test yourselves now I want to look at this from two perspectives one examine yourself to see if you're saved you know if you're living like an unbeliever be honest and say God am I a believer I mean at best you're a carnal Christian who's living like an unbeliever at worst you're deceived who wants to go through life deceived? Now, that's not the, the specific context of this. Paul's talking to brothers and sisters in the Lord. They are carnal. They are 
putting up with things that they shouldn't put up with. He is being unfairly attacked. But we all of us, we need to look at our behavior and let our behavior help us identify who we are. Whenever I hear somebody say, well, you know, I'm living with my girlfriend, I'm living with my boyfriend, but I'm a Christian, what makes you think you are? How can you, well, everybody does it these days, but if Christ lives in you, how can you say that? The man who is continually angry, the woman who continually holds on to unforgiveness. I'm a Christian, but I just, just hate those people. I'm just mad at those people. I can't believe what they did to me. How, how do you know? See, this isn't about what I know. It's not about what somebody else knows about you. This is about what you know about you. Tonight, you have the opportunity to deal with the, the why you won't let go of your unforgiveness, why you won't let go of the things that, that are really holding you back in your walk with the Lord. This is an opportunity to say, Lord, if I'm really yours, let me live like it. Examine yourselves. Deal with the sin before I get there is what Paul is saying because you won't like it if I get there and have to deal with it. So deal with it yourselves in exactly the same way the Holy Spirit begs us to deal with sin every day before his hand has to get heavy. That's why I tell you always to keep short accounts with the Lord. That's why if your life isn't characterized by constant prayer, you're in a dangerous place. We can get so busy and we can always put off time for prayer. That's why we need to stop thinking of prayer as that 20 minutes or 30 minutes or hour, God willing, in the morning where we get on our face and we cry out before the Lord. That's fine. It's wonderful. Do it if you have the time and the discipline to do it. But if not, pray all day, every day. Paul said to pray without ceasing. If you read his letters, his prayer list is pretty impressive. And the only way he could do it is to pray continually throughout the day. And I promise you, if you're in the presence of the Lord continually, if you're praying continually throughout the day, he's going to tell you if he can hear your prayers. He, he might say something like, look, I would love to hear you, but right now your sin is so loud, let's deal with this. And it's always better in private to let the Lord say, let's get this out of the way. And you can say, God, forgive me, I'm sorry. And then if it's something that you're afraid to let go of or something that you just don't know how to let go of, you can say, I know it's wrong and I want to stop it, but I need your help. But just to keep walking through life like it's okay is a really dangerous place to be. Sooner, as I said earlier, is always better than later. Sooner is always better than later. Why do we do things that we know are wrong? And why do we keep doing them? Is it because we're not examining ourselves daily? Sometimes hourly? Sometimes we find ourselves doing something or saying something or being around something that we know displeases the Lord. Do you respond instantly to it? Oh God, I'm so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. And then you can say, yeah, I do. I'm a sinner. No excuses, Lord. I'm sorry. And then you're able to open your heart again and be cleansed. See, that's the whole point. Bruce won't listen to a word I have to say because he wants me to get better. He wants to protect me against things that might happen. How much more the Spirit of God when it comes to the things of the heart, spiritually speaking. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Deal with sin before your sin overwhelms you. Deal with sin. He says, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? Some years ago, and it was probably, oh, 12 years ago now, before a Super Bowl, there was a all-pro player named Eugene Robinson, the defensive back for the Atlanta Falcons. And on the night, just before the Super Bowl, he was caught in a police sting operation soliciting prostitutes. Eugene Robinson was, is a devoted Christian, 
By all accounts, he really loved and still loves the Lord. He always was and remains to this day, all these years later, very public about his faith. Just one day before he was arrested in this vice raid, he was given an award recognizing his off-field character and his leadership as a man of faith. Now he takes the award. The next night, this man who loves Jesus is being arrested. Can you imagine on the eve of the Super Bowl, the biggest game of his life, what's going through his heart and mind? I mean, his sin has been exposed before the whole world. Before he got caught, before his sin was exposed, I promise you, the Spirit of God was trying to deal with him. The Spirit of God was trying to stop him from taking those extra steps, knowing what lay ahead. The Holy Spirit was simply begging him, don't do this. Let's turn around and go the other direction. But he still sinned. And as I told you earlier, he got caught because Christians always get busted. It's just that simple. Can you imagine? People get away with horrible stuff in this world. We get away with nothing if we're a believer. He loves you that much. He got caught before committing the physical sin, protecting his wife, children, but he got caught nonetheless. He was embarrassed publicly. His family was humiliated. And of course, his teammates were let down as well. Why did he do it? Well, there's no answer. Only he knows. Only God knows. But we all know why he got caught. It's because Jesus loved him too much to let him get away with it. And he was forced to deal with the public shame and humiliation, the consequences of his action. And there's a good ending to this story. He was genuinely repentant. He apologized publicly first, very publicly to the Lord, then to his teammates, to his family, of course. And then just to demonstrate that he was sincere about his apology and his repentance, he gave the character award back. My point is God was trying to get him to avoid that altogether. The heavy hand of God, this hand of conviction, this this encouragement to examine ourselves is God's way of saying, don't let it go any farther than it has to. Change tonight. If you're angry, stop being angry. If you're holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness, stop it tonight. If you're drinking too much, stop it. If you're involved in sexual immorality, whether it's pornography or a physical act with another human being that you're not married to, stop it. And do it before God exposes you. Remember, he's not angry with you. He's not impatient. He just wants the relationship that you once had back. And that's impossible with sin. Why would we do that? Why would we expose ourselves to that pain? It's easy. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? And then the dashes in your Bible, it's sort of a pause. Well, here's the only possibility. Unless, of course, you fail the test. Unless you're not saved. Unless you have no intention of returning to him or walking with him again. As we close tonight, this final portion of our study is a test. Notice again who you're supposed to test. It's you, not the person next to you. Not the people at work, not the people you live with. This is a test that deals only with you. And this is where we have to get ready to dig deeply into our hearts. It's the most important test you'll ever take. Now, I say that, it's sort of anticlimactic, because we need to take this test every single day. But it remains the most important test we'll ever take. Is Jesus really in you? I mean, why would Paul ask the Corinthians? Well, the answer to him is fairly straightforward. Whenever anyone's conduct looks more like sin than holiness, the obvious question is, are they really born again? Are they really Christians? You know, too many of us are eager to ask this question about other people. But we need to ask it about ourselves. Paul's approach is loving, it's direct, And it's different. He's saying, look, deal with yourselves.
before I get there and have to deal with it myself harshly. I want to deal with you lovingly. That's exactly what the Spirit of God is saying to us tonight. Deal with whatever it is in private. In a moment, we're going to have people up here for prayer. You don't have to tell them details, but you have to come and you have to say, I'm one of those people who's living a life that looks more like an unbeliever than a believer, and I want to repent. And you can do that and avoid the heavy hand of God getting any heavier at all. He is asking every Corinthian, Paul is, I'm asking every one of you to look into your own hearts and just your hearts and leave the hearts of others to them. What are you going to do about your walk with the Lord? Paul only wants the best for you. And while the Holy Spirit will take no for an answer, unlike Bruce, he's going to make it really hard. Because believe it or not, he loves you even more than Bruce does. Would the men and women from the class please come forward? Fathers, we close tonight.